Welcome, friends. Who's who has ever stood in that line outside? Has anyone ever done that? Has anyone ever stood out in the line in the cold for a goodie bag? Has anyone ever gotten a goodie bag? <laughs> they are in short supply every year. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you in this room in particular. Mercy for Animals is an organization that's really special to me. It's really close to my heart. And we have the, uh, we have the president here today, um, which is a huge honor for our festival. Um, Leah Garces is the president of Mercy for Animals, and she has been fighting for better food and farming systems for her whole career. What a career. And she has nearly 20 years of leadership experience in the animal protection movement. She's legit, y'all. She oversaw international campaigns in 14 countries at the World Society for the Protection of Animals, then launched Compassion and World Farming in the U.S. after having done that. Leah is also on the advisory boards of Encompass and Seattle Food Tech. Is that where you're based, Seattle? Guess where I'm based. Where are you based? Where am I based? Right here. Right here. Right here. You're a kid. I am. How long? Ten years. years. My goodness. <laughs> My <Surprise>. goodness. <laughs> well, this is an you extra special You didn't see me, but pleasure. I was an OG at VegFest. So. You were? Right yeah. From the beginning? From the beginning. Amazing. This is thrilling. In that tiny little space? Uh huh. Wow. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. Y'all remember, we've grown. <laughs> we love your support. Thank you so much. She lives here. She lives here with her husband, her three kids, and her two cats. Who couldn't come here because they're obsessed with marshmallows. So they went straight <laughs> to the marshmallow table. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Y'all, let's give a warm welcome. Thank you so much for that wonderful intro. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for choosing to be at this talk instead of free marshmallows, which is where my three kids are right now. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so how many people know who Mercy for Animals is? Woo! All right, that's pretty good. Okay, all right. Well, if you don't, I'm gonna, I think I have a clicker here. Here we go. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about us first before I tell you a story. Okay, so, is that working? Oh, I'm going to do the tricks. Okay, so I started Mercy for Animals for a, li a little over a year ago, but Mercy for Animals is celebrating its 20-year anniversary this year, which is super exciting. Woo, right? So we were started by a 15-year-old in Ohio and who was really unhappy with what he was seeing around him, and he started doing things like 
going into battery cage farms, hen farms, and filming them, and literally was pulling the video footage on a wagon behind him back in the day, pre, you know, pre-internet kind of days, and started to get the word out. And we grew, and we grew, and we grew, and now we're an organization in six different countries and 120 staff. And this is our mission, our vision. Who, who can, res who, who, does this vision resonate with anyone in the room? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. A vi our vision is a world where animals are respected, protected, and free to pursue their own interests. That's the world I want to live in. That's what gets me out of bed every day. Now, how are we going to do that? So, Mercy for Animals specifically focuses on constructing a compassionate world, a compassionate food system. And that word is very specific. So, Quite often as animal advocates, as animal rights advocates, we're seen as people who are just coming to tear down things, right? Tear down a way of life, someone's right to eat something, someone's uh, livelihood, and we're really trying to put another message, another narrative out there. We're not just here to end something that's bad, but we're here to construct something that's amazing, that everyone will benefit from. Because the system we have now is based on violence and oppression, and we can all benefit from a world that's based on compassion. And so we are about constructing that compassionate world. And there's two paths for doing that. One is by reducing the suffering of animals that are trapped in factory farming today. And there are 80 billion of them. And for the foreseeable future, for the short term, that's going to continue. And so we can't ignore that. And so Mercy for Animals works on slowly, slowly, slowly reducing the suffering of animals in that. And so those are things like getting rid of cages and crates. And we do that because we believe in reducing the suffering of the animals that are trapped in that system. But we have an end game in mind. And our end game is ending the exploitation of animals for food altogether. So we keep both of those in the balance. Still got everybody? Yes. All right. Still with me? Yes. Good. My kids still aren't here, but that's all right. Marshmallows are good. I know. I can't compete with dandies. No one can. Um, all right. So I want to start by, I'm going to talk about my book and my journey as an advocate and the work I've been doing and the work Mercy for Animals will continue doing. Whoops, I went one, one far ahead. Okay, so I'm from Georgia. I live, I've been living here 10 years now. And in the summer of 2014, I found myself sitting across from a man who by every definition was my enemy. My life, as you know, is devoted to protecting farmed animals and ending factory farming. And up until this point, my entire career was devoted to fighting against everything this man stood for. And now I was in his living room. And as I sat there, the questions were really swirling in my head. You see, I'm sure many of you know this, but it's really hard to get footage from inside a chicken factory farm. And I had been trying for years to get footage like this so I could show the public what was going on inside a chicken factory farm. But every attempt had failed on my part. As I sat there, I kept thinking, why in the world had this man invited me into his house? Mm. And more importantly, why had I gone? And that day, I had driven from my home in Decatur, not far from here, to his home in Fairmont, North Carolina, which is the poorest county in rural North Carolina. And as I drove there, I was convinced it was an ambush. I had told my husband, who's now sitting in the back with my three kids, they were able to tear themselves away from the marshmallows. Great. Um, I told my husband, look, here's the address. If I don't come back, look for me rotting away in the chicken litter. That's probably where I'll be. And my life did change that day forever. So that day, I met Craig Watts. He had been raising chickens for Purdue for 22 years, and Purdue is the fourth largest chicken company in the country. You see, when he was a young man, he had really searched for this way to stay on the land that had been passed down five generations in his family, in one of the poorest counties in rural North Carolina, where there were almost no job options. So tobacco had fallen out, and there was nothing else going on for him. So when the chicken industry came to town, he thought, wow, dream come true. So he took a quarter of a million dollar loan out 
at 22 and use that money to raise, to build chicken houses. And so Purdue brought chickens to him and he used those houses, he raised chickens, and then Purdue would pay him after each flock. And he would use that money then to pay off the loan like a mortgage. And at first it went fine, but of course, it's a chicken factory farm. And pretty soon, the chickens started to get sick. After all, these are chickens, 25,000 of them stuffed wall to wall in a windowless warehouse with feces on the floor that they're living on, toxic ammonia air that they're breathing. And when chickens get sick, some of them died. And you don't get paid for dead chickens. And he started to fall behind on his payments. He started to struggle to pay off his loan. And pretty soon, he realized he had made a mistake. He realized he had made a big mistake. But he had no way out at this stage. And he was basically an indentured servant. So when I met him, he had reached this breaking point where the payments seemed never ending, and so did the illness and death and despair of those chickens. Now, if we humans tried to come up with a system for food production that was really dirty and really cruel and really unhealthy and unfair and unjust, we literally, I don't think, could have come up with anything as horrible as factory farming. There are 80 billion chickens, pigs, cows that are killed and slaughtered and raised around the world every single year. And they're stuffed in warehouses and cages and they never see the light of day. But that's not just a problem for the animals, right? The world's factory farmed animals and the industry produce more greenhouse gas emissions than the world's planes, trains, and automobiles put together. And one third of our arable land is used to raise feed for feeding these animals in these cruel circumstances instead of humans. And ecologically important habitat is sprayed with immeasurable chemicals and cut down, rainforests are cut down, like the burning Amazon right now. By the time my kids in the back grow up, there probably won't be any Sumatran elephants, polar bears. In my lifetime, I'm 41, the number of birds, amphibians, mammals, and reptiles has halved. And the main culprit is our global appetite for meat, eggs, and dairy. And for me, up until this point in my life, the main villain was Craig Watts. But it's really easy to hate someone that you've never met before. So Craig and I had been sitting there for a few hours at this stage. And midday had gone from afternoon to dusk to evening and now it was totally dark and he suddenly said to me ready to see the chickens why had he waited i kept thinking for darkness and it occurred to me he didn't want to raise suspicion around him with his service tech with his neighbors he was as nervous as i was but we went anyway and he brought me under the cover of darkness down a dirt road until we reached these long gray warehouses. And we walked towards one of them. And I'll never forget it. He swung open the wooden door, we stepped inside, and I felt assaulted by an overpowering smell. And every muscle in my body tensed up, my eyes teared, I coughed. I was so overwhelmed with my own physical discomfort, I didn't even look around at first. But when I did, it brought me to tears. All around me were newly hatched baby chicks who were living on their own feces, on breathing toxic ammonia air, with nowhere to go and nothing to do. And I knew, without a doubt, those birds 
would grow at an unnaturally fast pace, driven by the genetics that they've been selected for, they would suffer and they would end up on someone's plate. So I returned many times in the months after that day and I walked those houses with Craig Watts. And I saw and learned and heard from him everything that there was to learn about chicken factory farming. And mostly what he did was walk those houses and pick up dead and dying chickens. Chickens that had messed up legs, had trouble breathing, could hardly walk. We captured all of that, all of those conversations, all of those horrors on film. And in the fall of 2014, we decided to do something I never expected to do. We decided to release that footage. And this was a huge risk for both of us. It was a risk for him because he risked losing everything. He risked losing his land, his income. He risked his neighbors hating him, his community hating him. Everyone around him raises chickens. So he was worried he was about to speak out against the income of his entire community. And I was working for Compassion and World Farming and I was worried about getting them sued or being the cause, the, the, the cause of him losing everything. But we did it anyway. And the New York Times broke the story. And within 24 hours, one million people had seen our footage. It went viral. And the horrors of chicken factory farming were on a global map all of a sudden, a global platform. And it was because of this unlikely alliance between a vegan animal rights activist and a chicken factory farmer speaking out against this industry. And this really got me thinking, what other unlikely allies are out there as we fight for a more compassionate food system and world? So, Two years later, well, so I, I started to really kind of think about this and collect lessons and think about these lessons. I want to share some of these lessons. I have three main ones for you. And the first one that I will tell you is that we have to become comfortable as advocates being uncomfortable. Speaking to people who agree with us, it's not going to get us to the solution. After all, the people who often hold the power to change the situation are not the people who are agreeing with us. So in my case, it was the chicken factory farmer and the meat industry. I'm not in charge of a single chicken. So if I want to change the industry, I have to somehow reach them. I have to enter their space. I have to figure out why are they resisting. I have to figure out what is their struggle. And I have to try to understand it if I'm going to get to a decent solution and make progress. And two years after releasing with Craig in the fall of 2016, I did something again I never expected to do. I sat down with a much bigger so-called enemy, <coughs> Jim Perdue himself. The very man I had made the villain of my viral video. After many long conversations, many difficult, uncomfortable, messy conversations with them. They decided to put out the first animal care policy ever by a big poultry company. And to address some of the things we had criticized them for not doing, like putting windows in the houses to let sunshine in and not making the farmers pay for them. And sure, they have a lot further to go. And we keep having those conversations and because of those conversations, because I'm willing to sit down, we keep making progress. The second lesson that I learned is that we have to see the so-called enemy that we're sitting down with as a human being that probably has a lot more in common with us than we care to admit. We're so engulfed in our principles sometimes that we don't want to have a conversation. We just want to be right. And we want the other person to be agreeing with us for the reasons we're agreeing. So I'm going to give you an example. I went to visit the headquarters of a chicken company not far from here. 
And it was the first time they had ever invited an animal rights advocate group to come and speak to them. And as we walked in, we checked in, we did our name badges, and we're walking, my coworker Rachel Dreskin and I are walking down the hallway, and literally we see people coming out of their cubicles like this. <laughs> like, what do animal rights activists look like? And I just look like this, so not scary. And we get into the main room, and the main executive in charge of the chickens, who's the main vet there, has his arms crossed, and he's got his head like this, and he's looking at me like, I do not want to be here. And I'm super nervous, and I'm pulling up my laptop, and up comes my, my uh, background photo on my laptop. And it's my three kids, Aww. right? And who are waving at you now, yes. <laughs> yes. And as I'm doing that, I see him uncross his arms and look at me and lean forward. And clearly my daughter looks different than the boys in the back over there. And he says, are those your kids? And I say, yeah, that's one. those are my kids. I, I had just been back one month from adopting my daughter. And I start babbling on about it, about all the highs and lows, and I was super emotional. I was just back at work, and it was really challenging, and I was way too chatty for a professional <laughs> talk. <laughs> and in those moments, though, he changed his body language, and he says to me, I have two adopted kids from China. And it turns out his family, his wife and him, run a ministry for foster care. And we used to start talking about the highs and lows of that and raising kids and for 20 minutes. And we totally forgot who we were supposed to be at this table. And in those moments, the wall came down and a bridge was built and we crossed this divide as two human beings who were able to connect. And because of that, we were able to trust each other and have a conversation. He was able to listen and I was able to listen and we were able to make some really concrete progress on how they're treating their chickens to reduce the suffering of those animals. The last lesson that I have for you is we have to look for the win-win. So instead of thinking about when I go to see somebody like Craig, or instead of thinking about Craig Watts, now I, I used to literally wish people like him ill. I used to wish, blame him and be angry with him. And I had to flip that mentality and think, instead of thinking, how can I put him out of a job? How can I put him out of his work and putting food on the table for his family? I started to think, how can I shift him into a different way of farming, like mushrooms or hemp or something else? And a farmer I later worked with named Mike Weaver did exactly that. So he did the same thing with me. We filmed inside of those his houses and exposed the horrific cruelty under Pilgrim's Pride. And he ended up quitting chicken factory farming. And it turns out that those warehouses raise, used to raise chickens are really good for something else. <laughs> That's hemp, by the way. <laughs> So it turns out this is an environmentally friendly way to stay on the land, make money. It's a win-win, one that a vegan animal rights activist and an ex-chicken factory farmer can get really behind. And instead of thinking about for these meat companies, I know, right? It's so cool. This is in West Virginia. And in fact, Mercy for Animals is coming out with a video on him on Monday. So check it out. And a new project called Transformation. Get it? <laughs> like that? Yes. Which is all about helping farmers transition out of factory farming and into other means plant-based products. And so instead of thinking with the meat industry, you know, I used to go in and think, I'm going to put them out of business. I'm going to make them bankrupt. So I switched my thinking and I thought, how can we help them evolve into a different kind of business? What do these businesses care about? They care about the bottom line, their shareholders, their brand, their customers, their employees. So how can I still meet that concern 
with a different business model. And you might think that's crazy, but you would be surprised because big meat companies are starting to shift in that direction. And you have companies like Tyson and Purdue and Cargill saying that they are going to explore plant-based alternatives. We all know Burger King has an impossible burger. I never thought it's an uh, impossible Whopper. Yeah. And this is an incredible evolution of a business that we should support. This is a win-win, where we're getting them to evolve into a different kind of business. At Purdue, Jim Purdue himself said to Bloomberg in an article, you can Google this later, he said, our company, our job is to produce premium protein, and nothing in that says it has to come from animals. I, it was like, what? A chicken company is saying that protein doesn't have to come from animals? This is their model. Yeah. This gives me a lot of hope. And if y'all live in Atlanta, you know about this. <laughs> yes. Right? KFC started testing plant-based chicken nuggets, and I was there. And I showed up at 10 o'clock in the morning when it opened, and you would think that they were giving out Beyonce tickets for free because <laughs> there were lines wrapped all around the building. There was traffic stopped all directions. They painted the building green. The world is ready for this shift. So is advocates. We have to think about building the biggest tent possible that everyone from the vegan animal rights activist, to the factory farmer, to the meat industry, can all get behind. We won't win over the world. We won't bring about a compassionate food system that we want by beating down our enemies, but instead by finding that win-win and forging a path together. And believe me, I know that's easier said than done. It takes a lot of courage and it's difficult and it's messy and it's uncomfortable to do that kind of work. But it's critical. It requires us, instead of thinking about us versus them, it's about all of us against an unjust system of violence and oppression. It's critical if we want to create that compassionate food system and world that we all, from the chicken to the factory farmer to all of us, deserve. Thank you.